Uh, we're doing a series. For those of you who are here for the first time or the first time in a long time, welcome. Thank you for coming to North Shore. We're doing a series this winter on making an impact. God has designed each one of us to have an influence, a positive influence in the lives of those he, he crosses path with. So we want to have an impact starting with our own family and then outward from there, the people we work with, go to school with, uh, the people we rub shoulders with in our community. And the way we do that essentially is being filled with the Spirit. When we are dependent and walking in the Spirit of God, we experience the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And that fruit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. These are the things that attract others. These are the qualities that minister to others that represent Jesus in our lives as we engage others. So we're talking about having an impact with our one and only lives, right where you are, right where you live, um, God wants you to have a positive influence for Him. Today, I want to talk to you about how you can have an impact and build relationships through food. And you may say, that doesn't sound very spiritual. Well, stay with me now. Why, well, stay with me. What's that old adage? You know, young women years ago used to be taught that the way to a, to a man's heart is through his... And that's not just true of men. It's true of us all. Uh, food is powerful, and it's a great tool to reach people because, and here it is, food connects. That's my central message to you today is that food connects. It draws us together. It gives us a reason to stay together, have a conversation together. That's why here at North Shore, we are unashamedly a foodie church. I don't know if you're a foodie person yourself, but we are a foodie church. We love food. It's part of our North Shore difference. And I know through the years I've had somebody and occasionally will say, why do we always have to have food? And I know it takes work to prepare food. I know it. But we do it not just because I don't trust that you're going to get home without starving to death. We do it to give us a reason to stay a little longer, to connect, have conversations, and food is a great tool for that to happen. Fool, food connects. So we intentionally use food to build relationships. And I want to just review with you all the ways that here at North Shore, we use food to build relationships. Think of all the ways that we offer food here at this church. We just finished two months, January and February, of homemade soup and bread. It's our 10th year of doing this. We had over 100 people typically staying after church on Sunday morning up to an hour afterwards. Where do you ever hear about things like that? Go to your average church and it's a show up and then leave for most of the people. And if we can get people to stay even just for a half hour afterwards, that's great. Get to know each other, go from just being an assembly together to being a family together. Food helps us do that. Right now, we have March Madness Munchies, where you bring your favorite snack, and we want to encourage you. Thank you for those who brought snacks today. If you haven't done it, we encourage you to kind of participate. Pick out a favorite snack and bring it. We've got more good snacks. Healthy food, vegetable trays, and not so healthy food corn dogs, whatever you want. And in between, we've got some great, great uh, snacks there for you afterwards. And it's all free. There's no catch. Each spring, we have Soaring Into Spring. On April 22nd, we're going to plan to have our Soaring Into Spring event where we invite the community to, to fly kites and shoot rockets. And literally, it's hundreds of kids and families show up. It's a great event for the entire community. And we offer free hot dogs, uh, we offer popcorn. We offer bottled water. It's our way of being good hosts. In the summer, we have summer barbecues. Many of you have participated in that. Out here on our patio, we barbecue hamburgers, hot dogs. We have pulled pork sandwiches. We do things like that once a month during the summer. Every Halloween, we have a community-wide event called Trunk or Treat. And it's truly a community event. We, we have close to 1,000 people here from our community who come kids galore. We even have a helicopter drop of candy, and we all get all dressed up, and they go around in a safe environment. But we offer, again, free hot dogs. We have popcorn. We have uh, bottled water. It's our way of saying welcome. Each February, we have the Red Dinner. Many of you have participated in that. We also have several dinner and movie nights. 
Uh, Dave likes to have those on occasion, and we've done that. Tomorrow night is a woman's event, a movie, and you saw the clip for that. And they're going to serve popcorn, and I've given them a special dispensation to have popcorn in our sanctuary. So we're hoping that everybody keeps their hands off the, the furniture and has a good time and uh, enjoys movie and popcorn. But we serve food almost every event. Why do we do this? Because, and say it with me, food connects. We'll do it again. Food connects. Remember that. It's not because we just are afraid you're going to be starving. It's because we know that food will give a reason to stay a little longer, have a conversation or two, connect with each other. God wants us to use, our, use food as a tool, not only to strengthen our fellowship, but also as an outreach uh, strategy to reach those who are currently far from God. When you invite someone to an event involving food, it just has a way of breaking down barriers. It builds bridges. It's hard to, to argue with while you're eating. Have you ever found that to be true? You got someone who has a different viewpoint, just give them some food. It's hard to argue while you're eating. So today I want to talk to you about food power. One of the best ways we can connect with others is by throwing a party that features food. And you may not be aware of it, but parties are a major theme in the Bible. You say, no. Yes, they are. And I want to share with you some party theology. So here are four biblical truths about parties found in the Bible. First of all, our God, our great creator, loves a party. God loves a party. Back in Leviticus chapter 23, in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 23, God outlined for Israel seven festivals. He commanded them to gather and celebrate seven festivals throughout the year. These were annual parties, four festivals in the spring and three in the fall that celebrate God's redemptive plan, not only for just Israel, but for all of humanity. And so God in his creativity structured for communicating his plan of redemption Centering that around seven festivals, seven parties, seven celebrations. God knows that we love a party. So he arranged seven of them, seven festivals throughout the year. God loves a party. When we gather for the right purpose, God's behind that. Second, the kingdom of God is often described in terms of a party. In Matthew 22, verse 2, Jesus said, the kingdom of God may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. So here we have a wedding reception. It's a party. And he likens the kingdom of God to that. In Matthew 25, 1, again, we have this analogy, this metaphor, that Jesus compares the kingdom of God to a wedding party where five foolish bridesmaids and five wise bridesmaids uh, are a part of it. In Revelation 19, 6 through 9, we're told that soon after Jesus comes the second time when he returns, there's going to be the marriage supper party of the Lamb. So picture a, a table that just goes on into eternity, and this is one meal you don't want to miss. This is one dinner reservation you don't want to miss out on. You want to have a reservation at this table, and you have that through Jesus Christ when you put your faith in him. So, isn't it interesting that the idea of heaven is centered around a feast, a party, a homecoming celebration? Three, third truth, Jesus loved to go to parties when he was here on earth. He loved to go to parties. In fact, he went to so many parties, he was accused by his religious critics in Matthew eleven nineteen. 19, Jesus summarized how his legalistic critics his religious critics thinks Pharisees, how they viewed him. He said in Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they said, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You can just imagine how they said that last word with spit coming out, sinners. Yet wisdom, he said, is vindicated by her deeds, by her fruit. Look at the fruit. He was able to interact and connect and draw people to himself through these parties. Jesus wasn't afraid to go to parties, especially when non-believers were present. Jesus came to break down barriers, and he knew that one of the best ways to do that is to break bread 
with others. So Jesus wasn't afraid to go to a party. In fact, the very first miracle he did was at a party. Remember what it was? John chapter 2, the wedding feast at Cana. And what was his miracle? What did they run out of? They ran out of wine. And so Jesus turned water into wine. He made all the Baptists there upset, but he didn't care. He made, I'm kidding. He made, uh, I'm come from a Baptist background, so I can poke that fun. But Jesus turned water into wine so the party could continue. This brings us to an important clarification. Even though we can kind of laugh about Jesus turning water into wine and keeping the party going, let me just clarify something. Even though Jesus was called by his critics a drunkard, nowhere, nowhere in the Bible do we find that Jesus got drunk. I want to be clear about that. Drinking alcohol isn't a sin in itself, but getting drunk, intoxicated is. Jesus never broke the law. He never sinned. So it is inconceivable to think of Jesus getting drunk. I believe he always practiced moderation. Kind of a good policy is one and done. One and done. We need to practice moderation. But I know what happens at many celebrations, especially in our culture. I've done enough weddings, hundreds of weddings over the years. I know what happens at many wedding receptions. You may as well. You may too. Statistically, On average, about one out of ten people in our culture don't know when to say when. One out of ten. About one out of ten will drink too much and get drunk. That's the average. As you know, we live in an alcohol-polluted society. We do. Too many people don't know how to have a good time without going too far and drinking too much. Any milestone, any cause of celebration is a reason for some people to, again, get drunk. Someone's birthday, well, let's drink. Someone's anniversary, let's drink. And again, I'm not talking about moderation. I'm talking about going too far. Someone got promoted, well, let's celebrate and have a party. Again, one out of ten will drink too much and not know when to say when. Someone's funeral, let's have an all-night wake with alcohol. And it can happen. So let me just be clear. I'm all for parties. I really am. But I want to be clear. I'm not for getting drunk. Uh, That's why as a church, any event that we sponsor will not have alcohol. It just won't. It's not that we're trying to be prudes. It's just that we don't want someone to trip up because of an event that we're sponsoring. Now, if you are having your own party, maybe it's a birthday party, anniversary party, whatever it is, and wedding party, and you want to serve alcohol, that's fine. That's up to you. All I ask is that you remember the rule, one out of ten. One out of ten, on average, won't know when to say when. So be careful. Just be careful. Alcohol should be used, but in moderation always. Amen? When I say one and done, some of you are thinking, well, how big of a cup is your one? <laughs> Keep it reasonable, folks. Keep it reasonable. And then the fourth thing I want to share about parties is every time a sinner repents, a party breaks out in heaven. This is a vision of God that we need to have. In Luke chapter 15, the religious leaders were mad at Jesus because he was hanging around with tax collectors and sinners. Non-churchgoers were coming to him. And they didn't like that. Their complaint was, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You can just imagine the venom behind their words. They were spoken with disgust and disdain. How dare he call himself a religious leader and hang around with those people and go to those parties? Jesus knew how far the the religious leaders' hearts were away from God's heart. And so he decides to tell them, not one, not two, but three stories. So any time in the Gospels where Jesus did this, tells them three stories in rapid succession, one after another, because he wants to drive home this point of how much sinners matter to God. And so he begins with his first story. And if you recall, the first story involves a shepherd who has a hundred sheep and he loses one sheep, just one out of a hundred. 
And rather than saying, well, okay, we've got to accept that, be pragmatic about it, what does he do? He leaves the 99 in the open and goes after that one. And he finds that lost sheep. And then what does he do? Well, he puts it over his shoulders and he rejoices and he gets back to his shepherd friends and he throws a neighborhood party. He says, let's celebrate. And then Jesus said, I tell you that in the same way there will be more joy in heaven, more joy over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. More joy in heaven. That's the heart of our God. And then he tells a, story, a second story. And if you remember that story, it involves a, a, a woman who loses a silver coin. She has 10 silver coins and she loses one of them. You say, well, what's the big deal? That represents a tenth of her retirement. Imagine if you lost a tenth of your retirement, a tenth of all your savings. And this woman goes in on a search in her house and she searches high and low and doesn't give up until she finds that lost coin. And when she does, she calls her friends and tells them, to rejoice because she found that which was lost. And Jesus again breaks in. He says, in the same way I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner, just one, that repents. Every time a sinner repents and gets right with God, a celebration occurs in heaven. Imagine that. And then to make sure we never forget this lesson, Jesus tells a third story. It's my favorite story of all the stories that Jesus told. It's the story of the prodigal son. Many of you remember that. It's a very tender, wonderful, powerful story. It's about a a son, the younger son, who gets tired of living at home, and he goes and demands his inheritance early, and his dad graciously gives it to him, and he goes off to a distant land. For us in modern times, maybe he gets all of this money, and he goes to Las Vegas. And he starts gambling and wild women and wild parties, and before long, it's gone. He doesn't have a penny left to his name. He gets hungry. He says, i got to find some work. So where does he end up working? At a pig farm. Now, you got to understand, for a Jewish audience, this is saying this is as low as you can go. Because pork, pig products, was forbidden for a Jewish person. And so when Jesus tells that he's working now for a pig farmer, they're thinking, oh my goodness, he's really hit bottom. And he's out there with those pigs, and he realizes they're eating better slop than he's eating. The pigs are better off than he is. And he has an epiphany. Suddenly he realizes, hey, my dad's servants are treated better than I am getting, receiving treatment. I know. I'm not worthy to be his son anymore, but I'll go home and beg to let me be one of his servants. And so that's what he does. And this is one of the most tender scenes in all of literature, folks. When the son is a long distance away, Jesus said his father saw him. Why did he see him? Because he was searching for him every day, hoping for his prodigal son to come home. And when he saw his son, what did the father do? He didn't just say, well, it's about time. I knew you'd come with your tail between your legs. No. He ran. Picture this elderly statesman running, picking up his tunic and running with enthusiasm to his son. And he hugs him. Just hugs him. And the son is ready to give his rehearsed speech, and the dad won't let him finish. He interrupts, and here's what the dad says. He says to one of his servants, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on my son. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf. The fatted calf was the only one who didn't like the son coming home. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. A party breaks out. And it wasn't just the fatted calf who was upset. Of course, if you know the story, it was the older son who didn't like what the dad was doing. But he said, we had to. Your brother was lost and he's found. We have to celebrate. That's God's heart. God wants us, folks, to celebrate milestones in our lives. When you have a birthday, I know each, because of how you're raised, some it's a big deal, for others it's not a big deal. It's a big deal, Uh, especially when it's a milestone birthday, what I call one of those decade marks. 
celebrate it. I understand Jeff Conwell's birthday was just this Friday, folks. He's embarrassed by all the attention, but it's a big deal when it's your birthday. I have a six-year-old granddaughter. My oldest granddaughter, Everly's birthday is tomorrow, and we're going to celebrate. And then the celebration continues next Saturday. We're going to have a bounce house. It just never ends. So we need to celebrate. My wife and I are 44 years of marriage. Number 45 is next year. I'm already planning because I'm amazed she stayed with me that long. It's such a miracle. I married out of my league. How many of you agree with that? Don't have your hand. Oh, come on. And anyway, we're going to celebrate that. We're going to celebrate these milestones. Joyless Christians avoid parties. Spirit-filled, joy-filled Christians love a good party. They know it's a great way to express God's joy and love. And this brings us now to parties with a purpose. I want to share with you a little bit about having a party with a purpose. One of the best ways that we can influence people for God is to throw a party whereby we intentionally mix those who know God with those who don't know God. This kind of a party took place in Luke chapter 5, 27 through 39. A tax collector named Matthew, one of the disciples of Jesus, well, he's just become a follower of Jesus. He just was converted and became a follower of Jesus. And to celebrate his new beginning, Matthew decides to throw a party. And who does Matthew invite? Well, his social circle. He invites his friends, fellow tax collectors, other Sinners, that's who he invites to his party. And Jesus is at this party. In Luke chapter 5, verse 29, it says, And Levi, which is Matthew, gave a big reception, a big party for him, that's Jesus, in his house. And there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. They were dining with him. Who's the them who is there? The them is Jesus and the 12 disciples. They are there as well. So what we have here is believers and non-believers mixing together in a social setting. Everything is going great. Everybody is having a good time until the social religious bullies show up. The Pharisees, dun da 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 These killjoys come, and they're not happy at what they see. So they grumble to Jesus' disciples. And they say, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Again, you got to get that spit out when you say that last word. And sinners, they say it with such disdain. Jesus overhears them grumbling, and he says this, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And folks, we're all sinners. Amen? We're all sinners in need of God's grace. Jesus was proud to wear his Eats with Sinners t-shirt. Have you ever seen that? I think that'd be a great t-shirt for us to wear, Eats with Sinners. Jesus was proud to wear his Eats with Sinners t-shirt, and so should we. Jesus knew that parties are a great way for us to build bridges to those who are far from God. It's a great way. They're a great way to relationally engage with people who are currently unengaged with God. But these kinds of parties, let me just warn you, are not opportunities to hammer people with the gospel. You can't have people come to a party that you invite and then say, okay, we got a captive audience. Let's get them. Let's nail them with the gospel. They won't like that. Nobody likes to be pressured. No one likes to be trapped. Years and years ago, my wife and I were invited to a party. We didn't know hardly anybody in the community, and these, uh, this one couple invited us to a party, and we thought it was just a social gathering to get to know each other better. And so we show up, and we're so excited that somebody would think of us. Somebody would invite us to a party. Do you know what it was? Yeah, you know that. It was an Amway party, but they didn't announce that it was going to be an Amway, if you know that company, an Amway party. It was suddenly... Uh, foisted on us, and we had no idea, and then we went through the sales pitch with them, and we came away thinking, man, that didn't feel right, because we thought we were going to come just to get to know each other, and suddenly it's uh, a different purpose. We don't do that. Think of these Matthew parties as pre-evangelism. 
as sowing seeds, getting to know others, building bridges and connections. And who knows where those conversations may lead in the future. Think of it as planting seeds. It's like the picture that says, and I love this picture, we cannot force someone to hear a message they are not ready to receive. You can't force it down their throats. But we must never underestimate the power of planting a seed. And then in this picture, it shows a tree, a massive tree that grows up and splits a gigantic rock in half. And that's what a seed can do when allowed to grow. The power of a seed. So these Matthew parties are an opportunity of planting a seed in someone's heart. What if you were to throw a party like that? What if your small group, if you're in a small group, got together and said, hey, you know what? Let's, let's think about a Matthew party. Who can we invite? A party with a purpose. A party where you intentionally mix the non-believers, people who are far from God, who don't show any interest in God, don't share your viewpoint with those who do share your viewpoint. Um, the ultimate purpose of this party is to show that people show people that Christians can have fun in a responsible way. And this brings us to the types of parties we should throw. I want to share with you several parties. So if you're taking notes, think about this. First of all, I encourage you to host a home party. Host a home party where you invite six, eight, ten people over, get to know them better. There's even a national movement. I don't know if you've heard it. You've heard of MEGA, Make America Great Again? Well, this is MEDA with a D. Make America Dinner Again. Isn't that great? MEDA, Make America Dinner Again. It involves the idea is you invite six to ten people over, people who don't all share your viewpoint. Again, that idea of mixing, getting to know each other better, and using food as a way to build relationship have a conversation. We need to be more intentional when it comes to reaching out to those who don't share our viewpoint. And sharing food is a great way to do that. Second, have a block party for your neighborhood. Who's on your neighborhood? Who, when's the last time you had your neighbors over? This can be a barbecue when the weather finally gets warmer uh, where everyone brings something and you have an outdoor barbecue. Third idea is have a big game party a sporting game that everyone is interested in. You all gather together to watch the big game. Super Bowl party comes to mind. We're having the final four in basketball. And if you know some others who are basketball enthusiasts, you might invite them together. Have some snacks. See where it goes. Try not to yell at the refs. Just have fun. Another idea is to have a beach party when the weather gets better. It's hard to imagine that now, but in the summer. Or a back-to-school party in the fall where you invite families of similar age children as yours together. Gather together. You might want to have an appreciation party that honors. Maybe you want to honor teachers or first responders or honor single moms. Years ago, Chris and I had a, get this, beach party in January in our church for senior citizens over the age of 80. And uh, they were to wear their brightest outfits. We had hamburgers and hot dogs, just like you would have at a, a beach party, but it's in the middle of winter. We had more fun uh, with that group, and they felt honored. Of course, it was 30 years ago, and we haven't done it again because we've not recovered from it. But anyway, I'm kidding. We had a great time. Be creative. Think about some ways. And then finally have a community party where we as a church invite the community. And that's what we try and do at least a couple of times a year. Our trunk and treat is a community-wide party. We invite families all over this area to come, have a good time, and we serve food with no catch. It's not what we do at North Shore. There's no, well, we want your donation. No, it's free, and free means free. Uh, we do that with the Soaring into Spring as a community-wide event for families to come and shoot rockets and fly kites. We have bounce houses there. And again, we serve hot dogs and popcorn and, and uh, bottled water as a way of saying, welcome. The point is, folks, and I, I, I want to be very clear, why do we do this? Because food connects. Food connects. It's an effective way to build relationship and conversation. I know that it takes time and work to prepare food and get ready for it. 
I want to single out a few people in our church who have been doing a great job of setting up tables every Sunday. You come back in that room and you'll see tables set up. Somebody has had to set up those tables. Somebody has had to put chairs around them. And, and, and Dave Elsey, and he's embarrassed, but I'm going to single him out. Dan James, he does it because his wife is involved as our coordinator, our hospitality chairman. And so Dan and Dave, thank you for that. You set up the chairs. You set up the tables. God bless you. Let's hear it for these guys. It, it takes work to practice hospitality. It just does. It doesn't happen. And is Pam in here? Would you grab her? Where is she at? I want to single out Pam, and when she comes in here, we'll really give her. She's our hospitality chairman. And she's been doing it all through the winter with soup and bread, getting it all set up, working with the volunteers. And uh, she's coming out. There's Pam. Let's all turn and give Pam. We love you, Pam, and thank you so much for all that you do in helping to make hospitality a key feature. On the radio, when I do my interview with Jeff, I'll say, come and experience the North Shore difference. Part of that difference is great praise music. Part of that difference is clear teaching from God's Word. Part of that difference is simply the loving spirit where we offer food, lattes, homemade or fresh-made cookies every week, and then the other snacks that we offer. It's what we do here at North Shore because food connects. In fact, Jesus described fellowship with Him in terms of sharing a meal together as friends. It's a great image that He gives. In Revelation 3.20, and I want to close with this, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he says, I will come in and dine with him, eat with him, and he with me. The very picture of fellowship with God is now being equated, described in terms of sharing a meal together. As far as the Bible is concerned, Food equals fellowship. I know there's unproductive things that can happen just as we gorge and eat food, but food is designed to connect as human beings, to share the hope and the joy and the love that we have in Jesus. And I know we all have food restrictions. We live in a day of special diets. And I know that food prices keep going up. But I want to challenge you as we close to use your creativity and have fun with this. And think of some people maybe that you could invite over or invite out, but connect through a common meal together. Who comes to mind? Who's someone in your life that you said, yeah, I I could invite them over. It's been a long time since we've gotten together. Who comes to mind? Let's be intentional. Let's reach out and use food in that way to connect with people one at a time, one meal at a time, one party at a time, one conversation at a time. Let's be the church that God wants us to be. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for this time in your word. As we talk about the use of food, a great tool for connecting and reaching out and and bringing together a sense of fellowship. We look forward to that marriage supper of the Lamb when we're gathered together and celebrating the return of your Son. We pray that we would be joy-filled Christians and always, always act responsibly and drink responsibly. We ask your blessing and healing for anyone who has a real problem in this area. Guide them and strengthen them. Set them free through the power of your Spirit. But Father, we pray that we as a church would not be afraid unashamedly of using food to help connect to build relationships, and to share your love and joy and hope. We love you. We commit our lives to you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.